All righty, everybody. Welcome. I think we'll make a start. Um, hello to all of you joining us from all across the world for the sixth webinar in the series on international biodiversity law post-2020. Um, this webinar series is organised as part of the annual course on multilateral environmental agreements, which is jointly organised by the United Nations Environment Programme and the University of Eastern Finland Law School in collaboration with the Government of Finland. My name is Alicia Harold Coley, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UEF Law School, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, before we start, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and recognize our First Nations continuing connection to country, their culture, the land, water, sea and community. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So to date, we've had a series of webinars that have introduced and delved into the workings of the Convention on Biological Diversity. We have questioned whether existing international biodiversity law is fit for purpose. And we have examined synergies between biodiversity law and other areas of international law. And this week, today's seminar, we will delve into the ocean realm and discuss why there is a need for better legal protection of biodiversity on the high seas and explore how the proposed agreement on biodiversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction will hopefully achieve this. The ocean covers almost 71% of the surface of our planet and of that approximately 64% is high seas. And this is an area that remains underprotected, especially as our impact through emergent technologies, worsening pollution and climate change is reaching ever further into this last frontier. Plastic has been found at the deepest point in the ocean, increasing temperatures and ocean acidification are changing conditions throughout the entire ocean. And on top of this, we can now travel further, drill deeper, and manipulate ecosystems in ways that we've never had the capacity to do so before. So this raises questions around how we govern these activities and how best to protect these fragile ecosystems. And to help us understand some of the challenges and opportunities in this space, we're lucky enough to have Associate Professor Joanna Mossop present to us today. Joanna is an Associate Professor and the Associate Dean of Research at the Law Faculty of the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. And she has an extensive background in international law scholarship, specialising in the international law of the sea, and has been closely involved in the ongoing BB&J negotiations. Joanna's book, The Continental Shelf Beyond 200 Nautical Miles, Rights and Responsibilities, was the joint winner of the JF Northey Memorial Book Award, and in 2019, Joanna was nominated by the New Zealand government to the list of arbitrators and counsellors under the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. So I have no doubt that you'll agree with me when I say that Joanna is more than qualified to speak to us on this issue today. Now, one last point before I hand over, um, and that is to say that this webinar is being recorded um, and that I highly encourage you to place your questions in the Q&A box. That's the only way that your, the audience is able to actually ask questions. Um, and you can upvote questions as well. And we'll use the Q&A from that box um, towards the end of the session. So without further ado, Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, so thank you very much to the organisers of these lectures to, for inviting me to present this lecture today. It's going to be very much an introduction to the issues and the processes behind this treaty negotiation, because of course it, it's not a complete treaty yet. Um, processes are underway in the United Nations at the moment. So today I'm going to structure my talk in three parts. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about why is this agreement necessary? Alicia has given some really great examples of why um, we need to be concerned about what's happening in areas beyond national jurisdiction, but I'll, I'll mention a few others. 
I then want to talk a little bit about the process and the history of the negotiations. And finally, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, where to from here and also link this back to the topic of multilateral environmental agreements, which this course has been focusing on. Um, so as Alessia mentioned, the high seas comprise about 64% of, of the world's oceans. And we don't often think about the high seas because they are a very long way from uh, the coastline and very few of us interact with it on a daily basis. But we are starting to see uh, a lot more human activity happening in the oceans. We've always had fishing, but fishing is now able to access uh, deeper and further waters than ever before. The International Seabed Authority is in the process of finalizing regulations for the commercial exploitation of seabed resources on this deep seabed. There are a whole range of sectoral uh, activities such as shipping, which also have an impact on the oceans. We're also seeing new and emerging uses of the oceans, such as climate geoengineering that may have an impact on the health and of, of marine biodiversity. So although um, we've got all of these human activities, there are some regulations that apply to that area. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is the primary source of regulations for this area. But unfortunately, uh, it's relatively light. There are a, a number of environmental protection provisions in the convention, but they are relatively vague. And because the convention was negotiated during the 1970s, the idea of biodiversity really wasn't uh, something at the top of the minds of negotiators. There are a range of global and, and, and regional organizations that deal with sectoral activities, and I'll come back to that soon. But at the moment, it's, it's rather um, light in terms of the amount of regulation that exists. I have here uh, an image from the IPBES report from 2019. And although um, that image relates to biodiversity generally, I think it's fairly easy to apply the, the five drivers of species loss to the oceans. Quite simply, marine biodiversity on the high seas, as well as within national jurisdiction, uh, are really subject to a number of important stresses. As I mentioned, changes to the uses of the oceans are increasing in pace and frequency. We've always been aware that overpressure from fishing, for example, does lead to uh, a problem for marine biodiversity, not only for the fish stocks that are targeted by the fishing, but also the organisms and ecosystems that are, are related to those fish stocks. At the moment, the FAO estimates that about two thirds of the fish stocks are currently either overexploited or fully exploited, which leaves very little room for movement. Climate change, of course, is at the top of everyone's mind and the oceans are not exempt from the impacts of climate change. The warming oceans is having an issue. And for example, we're seeing fish species moving polewards in a way that we wouldn't have anticipated several years ago. Also, ocean acidification is a, a significant issue. Now, while that is not necessarily, um, we can't necessarily fix that in a treaty related to the oceans, uh, it does mean that the environment is more fragile, it's more vulnerable to extreme stresses and human activities. So it needs to be factored into any decision about regulation of the oceans. And I'll, I'll pass over on pollution and invasive alien species, although obviously they are also big issues for, for the ocean. But one thing we do know, and that is that marine biodiversity is under threat. Uh, and the current regulatory system just simply doesn't uh, manage to address this. Now, all is not lost. Um, a couple of reports in 2019 gave us reason for hope. The IPBES report tells us that if we undertake transformative change, we can still ensure that biodiversity generally, but also in the marine environment, can be managed sustainably. 
And they defined transformative change as a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. The IPCC also tried to offer some optimism, um, and they referred to sort of some of the existing tools that we have, which is include, for example, precautionary system-based management, renewable resource use, and reduction of other stresses. Um, so they, they also see reason for hope. And it might be interesting for us to return to these ideas at the end of the lecture, to see whether you think that we're on track for achieving this positive change. So far, we're facing an oceans governance framework from an environmental perspective that has a number of weaknesses. As I mentioned, there are a number of treaty bodies and institutions that apply mostly sectoral regulations to the high seas. But these are very poorly integrated and there's really very little opportunity to achieve any sort of area based management. Um, for example, a fisheries body might impose a, um, a closed area, but the ISA may authorize seabed mining in that area. So they're just simply very little coordination and cooperation between those institutions. As I mentioned earlier, um, we, we do, are seeing new and emerging activities and at present because the law of the sea convention doesn't have a conference of the parties in the same way that most multilateral environmental agreements have, then um, there's really no clear way to deal with new and emerging activities and their potential impact on biodiversity. Um, we know that Many of the existing regimes are failing to properly manage the impacts of human activities on biodiversity. And one of the types of organization that is frequently uh, tasked with this problem is, uh, for example, regional fisheries management organizations. While some are doing reasonably well, there are a lot who are subject to um, pressures from economic activities, and they sometimes are not at the forefront of good environmental practice. I think it's also fair to say that the gap between developed and developing countries is also important here because it's largely and primarily the industrialized countries that are putting much of the pressure on uh, the oceans uh, and developing countries clearly would like to engage in these economic activities too. But the more uh, pressure that we have from new actors, that just worsens the problem. In addition, uh, developing countries argue that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which I'll refer to as UNCLOS, um, has provisions for capacity building and transfer of marine technology, which have not been implemented by most of the parties. And finally, um, there is no institutional mechanism. Um, so if we have concerns about sustainable use of biodiversity, um, then the, the UNCLOS doesn't provide a, an appropriate forum to discuss this in a, in a way that can lead to regulation. I quite like um, the following series of charts that the Pew Environmental Organization uh, published. And what it does is it highlights uh, the institutional both overlaps and absences in relation to the high seas. If you look at this picture and it's mapping a number of regional organizations, it doesn't include global organizations like the International Maritime Organization or the International Seabed Authority. It looks like there are plenty of organizations that can regulate the high seas. But the first thing you'll notice is there's a lot of overlap. But when you drill down into that, um, the conservation mandate, um, if you look at it from a conservation perspective, fewer of these organizations have it, even some conservation mandate. And then when you look at it, whether they have a primary conservation mandate, you see even fewer. And what's really telling is the next slide, which talks about those um, those parts of the world that where there are organizations that can deal with cross-sectoral activities. And you'll see, well, there are none. So this, I think, sort of illustrates in a, in a short um, pictorial sense how fragmented and, and difficult the, the institutional problems are. So moving on to the BBNJ, which I'll refer to. Um, BBNJ is the common acronym used by negotiators in this area. 
um, you will see that the, the official name for the negotiations are, is quite lengthy and hence it's been um, shortened to BBNJ. So it, the uh, origins of BBNJ actually go well be, um, before the 2017 UN General Assembly resolution. In 2006, uh, a series of ad hoc informal working group meetings were, uh, were authorised by the General Assembly to discuss the issues of, of BBNJ and biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and this took a number of years um, for parties to get closer to even agreeing that a treaty was necessary. Um, in 2011, uh, there was a sort of a political agreement that allowed things to move forward. There was a preparatory committee. And then in 2017, at the end of 2017, the UN General Assembly authorized the negotiations to begin. And four sessions were agreed by the General Assembly. Now, a really important aspect of this topic is the scope of the negotiations. The package identified in 2011 agreed on four substantive areas to be addressed by the agreement. The first is marine genetic resources, um, known as MGRs for short. And this relates to the legal regime for, um, for exploiting, essentially, genetic resources found in areas beyond national jurisdiction. While this isn't um, directly a biodiversity issue, um, it is something that was identified as lacking uh, in the UNCLOS uh, provisions, and it was a matter of high importance for developing states that these uh, issues be addressed in this agreement. The second topic is area-based management tools, including marine protected areas. And as I mentioned earlier, the lack of any ability to do any sort of area-based management um, beyond an independent sector was of real concern to a number of states. And also how you can get marine protected areas on the high seas um, that are opposable to as many states as possible. Um, the environmental impact assessments um, um, essentially are building on provisions that are already in the um, in the Law of the Sea Convention, but most would argue that they've been poorly implemented. And of course, environmental impact assessments are a very uh, common and bread and butter part of international environmental law now. So it was important that these get fleshed out and a process agreed. And finally, capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. Um, this, of course, addressed issues and questions that developing states have about the poor implementation of capacity building. And this was in part um, to ensure that those countries could comply and implement the agreement when it's concluded, but also reflects the uh, developing countries' real interest in ensuring that, um, that they're not left behind. Now, a final and very important part of the instructions from the General Assembly was the instruction that this process and its result should not undermine existing relevant legal instruments and frameworks and relevant global, regional and sectoral bodies. And this is a very important part and is both underpinning the, the political agreement to proceed with negotiations, but also in some ways causing a bit of a problem. And I'll come back to that a little bit later in this talk. The, the reason for including this is that a number of um, particularly industrialized states were concerned that the BBNJ not um, upheave, create an upheaval for existing organizations and try and cut across the subject areas that they already um, cover. So where are we now? Um, well, uh, the third meeting of the IGC was held in August 2019. And we were able to discuss a draft text at that session. Now, the fourth session was scheduled for, for March in 2020. And of course, everyone knows what happened. We had COVID. Um, so although we do have a new draft um, that was issued in late November 2019, the international community hasn't had a chance to get together to meet. And we're now hoping that this will happen in early 2022. Um, I, I also note that the, the draft issued um, for the second, uh, the second draft didn't contain significant changes. Um, so that was, was interesting for a number of observers. 
So what I'm going to do now is just briefly go through the four uh, subject areas and just try and introduce you to some of the legal issues that are arising under those different areas. Um, so many of you may know that the um, Law of the Sea Convention um, sets out that the mineral resources on the seabed are covered by the principle of the common heritage of mankind. And this involves um, benefit sharing through the, for the entire international community of the benefits from seabed mining. A question was raised um, very early in the process as to whether or not this principle would also apply to the living resources on the seabed, so organisms. And as you may be aware, um, biodiversity is, is very, um, a very attractive thing for companies that are looking to, um, to develop biotechnology products. Um, they've been used for pharmaceuticals and um, cosmetics and industrial purposes, um, and especially extremophiles, which, um, of which there are a number um, based on the bottom of the ocean, for example, in um, hydrothermal vents. There was a long drawn out process which hasn't yet been resolved between states on the one hand arguing that common heritage of, the man of mankind applied and on the other hand states arguing that the freedom of the high seas applied which meant that companies would be able to take samples and, um, and essentially use them as they wished. There has now after very many years of debate been an agreement that there should be a legal framework included in the BBNJ. But I have to say that there are a large range of issues that have yet to be agreed among the parties. Most importantly, um, the principle of common heritage of mankind. The G77 in China um, have been very vocal in pushing to, to, for the inclusion of common heritage of mankind. Other countries have been uh, arguing that there's no need to include common heritage of mankind, that we can use a bespoke um, regulatory framework to deal with these sorts of um, resources. In addition, uh, there is um, huge questions about the definition of MGRs, for example, does it only apply to um, organisms that are taken directly from the ocean? Does it also apply to digital sequence information and so forth? And, and those of you who have worked or are familiar with the CBD will be familiar with some of those um, issues that have been discussed at length in that context. There are questions whether um, access um, should be based on freedom, complete freedom or permit or notification or something along those lines. And a really key question is how benefit sharing might occur, um, particularly whether or not monetary benefit sharing is required, as opposed to other types of benefit sharing, including capacity building and um, sharing of information. So this is probably the most difficult topic that the negotiators are dealing with. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, um, even though there have been um, some discussions off, so online uh, in the last year, I'm not, I don't see a lot of evidence that, that significant progress has been made towards bridging that gap. So area-based management tools, um, including marine protected areas. Um, so there hasn't been too much or problem with the idea that we should allow for the creation of marine protected areas and ABMTs. Uh, the problem, of course, primarily is with the institutional frameworks. So for example, uh, if you have a regional fisheries management organization, what role do they play in uh, a marine protected area? Um, should uh, the COP for the BBNJ be able to sort of say, we want a marine protected area or just, in, or just suggest to the RFMO what happens if the RFMO doesn't want it? There's a real problem here, um, and this is probably at the core of the disagreements about this one. Um, so so we've, we've got some provisions in the convention, draft convention, about identification of areas and so forth, but it's actually the how you implement this with other organisations that may have responsibility for these areas, um, that, that it still remains un, unsolved at this stage. In relation to environmental impact assessment, as I said, um, there is provision in UNCLOS for um, 
environment, some form of environmental impact assessment, but it certainly doesn't reflect the most common um, sort of state of the art approaches to environmental impact assessment. Um, so there are a number of questions here. And again, there's quite a lot of draft provisions in relation to EIA. Um, some of the, the, the really fundamental questions still need to be resolved, such as for what activities will a country need to conduct an environmental impact uh, assessment? Is it based on the effects on the marine environment or will it exclude certain activities that are already governed by sectoral organisations? What happens if the sectoral organisation doesn't have a provision for environmental impact assessment? Does that mean that environmental impact assessments are not needed? Um, so, so this is still a, a fundamental question that hasn't yet been resolved. Um, there are questions about process. Um, so uh, to what extent does the state conducting the EIA have to, or responsible for the EIA have to notify other countries uh, what consultation processes need to happen? And do the BBNJ institutions have any role in that environmental impact assessment? So uh, some suggestions, for example, have been that a scientific and technical body could have uh, the role of oversight of environmental impact assessments. Um, or, but, but that obviously is not attractive to a number of states. So again, we've got a long way forward on the EIA, but there are still some important questions to be resolved. Um, finally, capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. Uh, as I mentioned, um, this is part in part driven by um, the, the problems with implementation of part 14 of the law of the sea. And in, this is an, an interesting contrast to other multilateral environmental agreements because um, develop, capacity development, um, financial assistance, as many of you will know, is a, is a big feature of many of our modern environmental agreements. Um, but that hasn't tended to be a feature of UNCLOS. Um, and I think um, this is partly because UNCLOS is seen as, as an enabler for states to allow them to do things. And there is obviously reference to developing countries and a special status of developing countries, for example, in the seabed mining provisions. But really, um, there hasn't been a very large call for um, industrialized countries to, to provide capacity building. Now, now a lot goes on um, through, particularly through UN agencies, the FAO, uh, UNEP and other places, but there has been a feeling that, um, that some countries haven't really taken it seriously. Um, I know that a lot of developing countries are, are hopeful that as well as being the recipients of, of um, benefits from MGR development, that they themselves might build the capacity to undertake um, scientific study of uh, marine organisms and actually do the biotechnology themselves. But of course, for many of them, they just um, may not be in a position yet to do that. And so um, there has been a big focus on um, how you upskill countries to, um, to, to really enable themselves to take advantage of the technology. But there are also issues of implementation and um, you know, very genuine issues of implementation. Uh, for example, the environmental impact assessment provisions require a, you know, quite a technical process. And if um, a, a small country with few resources has to go through that process, what assistance do they get to ensure that they're complying with their obligations? Now, the issues around this um, I see as primarily uh, related to the, the, the question whether developed countries must make mandatory contributions or only voluntary contributions. And of course, this again reflects the political climate in other environmental fields where countries seem to be less willing to, um, to give money to, um, for financial assistance. Um, and I'm thinking here of climate change, it's been a big struggle. Um, I think the same reluctance is applying uh, here. So naturally, um, developing countries would prefer to see mandatory contributions, uh, whereas uh, a lot of industrialized countries consider that voluntary um, donations is, is appropriate. Okay, I just want to say a few um, few things now about the process of negotiations. Um, remember at the beginning, I talked about some of those um, positive um, 
sort of ideas that we could potentially implement um, to make marine biodiversity uh, protection much stronger. Um, and that I sort of see comes down to as a, a, a trade off between participation and ambition. Um, and this is a very unscientific line, but essentially, um, the greater, in general, the greater the participation, the lower the ambition. And that's because for, for good reasons, uh, if you get a lot of countries agreeing uh, on, on a treaty, then often the, the treaty language becomes more vague so that it meets the requirements, political requirements of all those countries. Uh, similarly, if you, you want to have a very ambitious treaty, you tend to find that you're encouraging fewer states to sign up. And so the, the goal, I guess, here for these negotiations is to find a sweet spot between as high participation as possible and reasonable ambition. Um, so obviously full participation is important. Um, and the president of the conference, um, Ambassador Rena Lee, has repeatedly commented that her goal is to get full participation uh, in this treaty, both in the negotiations and once it's signed. Um, and of course, that's really important when you're dealing with the high seas, where there's a, a large amount of freedom on the high seas and, and flag state jurisdiction is essential. Obviously, it's important to get as many states um, on, on board as possible. But my, um, <coughs> excuse me, real worry is that um, if we, if we eliminate all ambition, um, we may get full participation, but we may not necessarily see a, a, a good effective treaty. But that's a normal situation. Whenever you're negotiating any international uh, agreement, um, this, is, this is something that has to be done. I just want to, at this stage, draw a parallel with another implementing agreement of UNCLOS, and that's the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. The UN Fish Stocks Agreement was developed in 1995 um, and it was considered quite groundbreaking at the time. Um, for example, it required states to uh, cooperate with RFMOs or not fish in that area. Um, and it was seen as it, there are some holdout states and it took, uh, I think, six years for states to sign up. But it's now a very influential piece of international law that has an impact beyond just the parties to the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. And so my, um, my argument is that, you know, you might have to accept that we're not all going to get full participation, at least at first, but it's worth uh, pushing as, as much as we can for as, as effective agreement as we possibly can. But of course, different states will have different perspectives on that. Um, this is just my, my opinion. Um, Moving to the not undermine uh, issue, and, and, and again, I think I really alluded to this when I was talking about some of the, um, the, the main topics here, uh, and that is how the, the um, ILBI will interact with global, regional and sectoral bodies. Um, what can COP do? It seems to me that we're on a spectrum. Um, it, it, it will well and truly taken off the table the possibility that the COP could override any existing institutions. Um, so we're really seeing um, sort of different emphasis from different states depending on what perspective they want to take. So at one end, you say that there is a, a view that if there is a, a body that exists that has a mandate for activities on, a, on the high seas, then COP cannot discuss it, cannot take any decisions on its subject matter. So it's essentially a carve out from the mandate of the COP. On the other hand, um, another option is that the COP um, could still take decisions in relation to that subject matter, for example, making recommendations, or um, to the extent that the, the existing body doesn't have a mandate for a particular issue like conservation, um, the COP could take uh, a complementary uh, approach and, and implement things that don't over, override the regional fisheries management organization or whichever organization you're dealing with. Um, and this is, is quite a difficult process to, to work through. Um, and, and one issue, for example, is that with regional fisheries management organizations, they have the authority to regulate, but they actually tend to only be um, represent, representatives of that organization are only fishing states, and they don't necessarily 
reflect the interests of the wider community. Um, this is an ongoing issue. Um, and one thing I, I did like, um, Vito De Lucia in a 2019 um, blog said, in fact, what we actually need to be thinking is, is thinking in terms of complementarity and compatibility, rather than trying to delineate geographically and materially the individual and open, overlapping mandates. Um, and I think that's a really nice sort of way to think about this not undermining problem, um, because inevitably we're going to start, you know, running into some problems. Somewhat connected with this idea um, is something that appears in the draft uh, agreement, and um, this is draft article eight. And this is in the introductory section, which deals with um, the scope of the agreement and, and general principles and things like that. Now, what I've highlighted um, the fact that there are there is bracketed text in this, um, and and you'll see that. Um, sorry, this applies. Sorry, this is in the marine genetic resources part. Apologies for that mistake. Um, you will see that this part, the, the choice here is between the part and the agreement. So if you read it in terms of part, and this is probably where a lot of states were coming from, is that there is a general agreement that um, the marine genetic resources provision should not apply to fish. Um, that are caught as a commodity, so the traditional fishing approach. And so if you read it as this part, then that makes sense, right? So it just means that marine genetic resources do not include um, fish caught for um, commercial purposes. However, there still is in the draft agreement uh, another option in the bracketed text, which says agreement. Um, and what this means is if this was accepted, then the provisions of the agreement would not apply to, the, to fish as a commodity. The effect of this would be to remove fishing completely from the scope of the BBNJ. And considering that fishing is one of the activities with the highest impact on marine biodiversity, this actually causes me some alarm. In 2019, when we could still travel, I was in, um, in Germany um, to for a conference and President Rena Lee told, told the conference that she thought that states were leaning towards uh, ex excluding fish from the agreement as a whole, um, which I don't know necessarily reflects um, what everybody um, is, is thinking. So this sort of shows you that things are still relatively unsettled um, and um, we, it's, it's yet to be determined what, where this will go. But this is again this undermining issue um, coming up once more. So to finish with, I, I just wanted to sort of ask the question, will this BBNJ treaty be an MEA since this course is about multilateral environmental agreements? And I remember back at the beginning of my career, I attended a meeting of the American Society of International Law, and I was attending a session on international environmental law, and someone started talking about fishing, and they stopped after about a minute, and they said, well, is fishing international environmental law? And I think for me, that's, that's encapsulated the, the difficulties with the siloing of international law. Although the BBNJ Treaty has drawn on a number of uh, environmental law aspects, the, the majority of the uh, negotiators are, are very much thinking of this as a law of the sea treaty. And that's as it should be, because the, the treaty is essentially an agreement under the law of the sea convention. And so, of course, law of the sea is a key component. But it seems to me that um, the that there is more that could be done to draw on multilateral environmental agreements. Um, there are some characteristics of multilateral environmental agreements here. Um, for example, um, there's, a, there's a proposal to establish a COP, a secretariat, a um, scientific and technical body, um, which mirrors very much what goes on in multilateral environmental agreements. And this really reflects the idea that we need to have an ongoing regulatory function available. Um, the influence of the Convention of Biological Diversity is very clear, um, especially in the discussions around marine genetic resources. And also there is a, a provision in the draft text which potentially could lead to a non-compliance regime. Um, 
However, one of my concerns um, is that there is a very exclusive focus on the four elements. And while there is um, some emphasis on broader ideas, such as general principles, for example, um, at the moment, the evidence of um, general obligations to protect the marine environment um, are relatively few and far between. There's obligations to cooperate, um, and there are obligations in respect of each of the individual elements. Um, but I would have liked to have seen more sort of general uh, provisions and similar to the CBD. Um, and so what, I, what my concern is that um, the institution may be limited to only considering the four elements of the package. Um, while the draft text at the moment does include uh, the, the COP has power to consider any other issues relating to marine biodiversity, which would give it the ability to develop and evolve in a similar way to the COP from the CBD, um, that is un that's not accepted yet. I think there are a number of states that would like it to be very much ref re refined to um, simply the four elements of the package. And one of the reasons for that is that there is a real fear that um, if you give any um, leeway within the Law of the Sea Convention, that that might provide room for, for states to, to try and renegotiate the fundamental agreement that um, underpins UNCLOS. Um, and there is some sign in the international community that this might happen. So, so it's understandable that states are nervous about empowering a COP to, um, to, to, to look further. Um, however, um, hopefully the, the decision-making powers under the COP um, will sort of give some um, comfort to those states. Uh, and I really hope that we're going to leave enough room within the convention to allow for um, broader discussion of marine biodiversity. So uh, that's the end of my prepared remarks. Um, I hope that's given you a, a sense of what the biodiversity uh, tr treaty negotiations are about. And I look forward to our discussions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was a really amazing uh, description and, and coverage of the issues. And I think it was really interesting how you brought in a few of your own concerns which perhaps we can delve into a little bit more during the question time as well. Um, we do have quite a few questions so I will just work our way through the list um, if that's okay um, and we've had a few questions upvoted as well so there's clearly some similarities in thinking um, in the audience around some of these questions. So to kick off with, um, the first question was about undermining uh, the element that you brought up just a couple of slides ago, ago. And so the question says, it was said that BBNJ negotiations aim not to undermine existing relevant legal instruments and frameworks. At the same time, the 2019 IPCC report says that a fundamental system-wide reorganization of paradigms, goals, and values is required. Isn't this contradictory? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I think Cesar um, asked that question. Um, and yeah, you've, you've seen my point, um, sort of. I, I, uh, I started with those comments from IPBES because I think it, it is important for us to keep in mind that the seriousness of the challenge for protecting marine biodiversity. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, I do think that the not undermining um, has somewhat weakened the ability of the BBNJ treaty to, to end up with a, a highly ambitious treaty. That's not to say that it, it, it can't achieve this, um, but it is really going to depend on the states that are involved, not only in the BBNJ, but also in the other um, sectoral and regional organizations uh, to, to really make a, a commitment to um, protection of biodiversity. And that's one of the reasons why, and it's not too late, I, I would think it would be really great to see a really strong general statement of principle in the BBNJ to say, you know, you know, we need to work towards protecting marine biodiversity. Because if you've got that in the BBNJ, you can take it back to those other organizations and say, you know, we're not doing well enough here, we need to do better. Um, and that's another reason why I think um, that 
you know, completely full participation may not be necessary. Um, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement had a big impact on RFMOs, for example, even though not every party to an RFMO was, um, was um, party to the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. Um, so yes, I mean, my, my sense now is that uh, the ambition is, is definitely lower than, than many observers would have liked, but you know, that's the result of international negotiations. All right, we have another question which has been upvoted by a few people um, from Gibrilla, and she asks, does the draft capture powers and responsibility to prosecute violations in the a ABNJ? If not, would future negotiations address this? That's another great question. Um, there is, um, has been some attention on um, implementation. Um, now, the, I think the general approach has been that we're not going to upend the principle of exclusive flag state jurisdiction in this situation. So um, the general feeling is that states need to implement uh, this into their own law to give themselves the powers to uh, enforce that, uh, that those provisions. And I just don't think that we're going to see any different types of enforcement provisions. Um, and, and I just don't think that there's any appetite for that that I can tell. So I think enforcement and implementation is, is something of a, um, I guess it's not high on the agenda. There's been some discussion about it, um, but it, it is potential. There's a possibility that the COP could, could raise this later. And I also think we also need to be thinking as well about non-compliance procedures um, to, help us deal with states that aren't fulfilling their obligations in the way that they should be. So that's all part of a similar sort of package that, that needs to be resolved. Um, great. We have a question from uh, Galena and who asks, um, I would like to ask if there is any interaction with the Cartagena Protocol and biosafety, which controls living modified organisms. Um, thanks for that question, Galena. Um, there hasn't really been any discussion of that. Um, I think there's just a general recognition that this treaty is all about the high seas and all about areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and, and living uh, modified organisms are not really something that people have been thinking too hard about. I think uh, the other issues have been sort of more important than, than, than for, for the states than that. Um, so no, um, as far as I'm aware, the Cartagena Protocol hasn't really come up. Of course, other issues like the Nagoya Protocol and the CBD have been a big, playing a big part in the negotiations. All right, um, Inna asks, um, do you have any suggestions for drafting the agreement to achieve complementarity and compatibility with existing frameworks, instruments, and bodies? Wow, that's a huge question. And if I had the answer to that, I think I'd win the Nobel Prize. But um, look, there's been a lot of academic work being done around the issue of the institutional mechanisms. Um, and different people have, uh, have different things, um, have suggested different ways of doing this. There's a, a great paper by Nicola Clark in Marine Policy that came out, I think, last year. And I just heard this morning um, that there's a Frontiers in Marine Science paper um, coming out, which talks about the possibility of using the principle of subsidiarity. So, I mean, there are, you know, people are working on this um, and, you know, we don't, we don't have a, a clear answer to this. And, and the drafting, I think, is, is less important than the political consensus because the you know, what we're really talking about here is a disagreement among states as to how those institutions will work together. Um, and, and until we get a clear sense of that, it's going to be very hard to draft something um, that, you know, that, that answers those questions. So I think what I want to see first is to see, you know, starting to come together to understand, to agree on what that might be. Um, one thing I do worry about is that there is still so many issues that appear to be unresolved. Um, and we've got one session that left that's been authorized by the General Assembly. And certainly at IGC, um, the talk from the president was that she was expecting to conclude the treaty in, in the next session, um, which many of us think 
possibly a bit unrealistic. Um, and certainly if it was concluded in the next session, then we're worried that it may be um, a little bit too rough around the edges, too ambiguous. Um, and, and then we start, the problems start arising somewhere else in the COP or dispute settlement or, 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 or somewhere like that. So in many ways, um, it's great. It's, it's, it might be better to wait until we have that agreement. On the other hand, um, a lot of people have pointed out that the that there is a, still a long way between some states. And I think there are a few states who would be quite happy if this agreement was never concluded. Um, so again, if we insist on this full participation idea, then we, we're also going to be struggling. Um, Janine asks, one of the issues in the BBNJ negotiations that relate to the not undermining whether or not is whether or not the treaty is an MEA or confined to being strictly under the under UNCLOS. And to the extent to which there is, will be strong international institution versus a more decentralised approach. What are your reflections on the tension between the treaty creating international architectures versus a regional approach? Um, great question. Um, so I think um, we, we've... We've definitely got agreement now that there will be some institutional framework. So um, I'm pretty confident that we, we, we've, we've got agreement that there will be a COP, probably a scientific and technical body. So it starts to look a lot like your traditional um, MEAs in that respect. And I'm not really saying that it's an either or situation. So it's not just that it's either a MEA or a, a, an UNCLOS treaty. Um, I think definitely it's an UNCLOS treaty because that's the, it, it's, meant to be a treaty under UNCLOS, but the question is whether, you know, um, we can borrow um, enough from MEAs to sort of bring in the good parts of MEAs to help strengthen the process. And, and certainly the institutional structure is actually really important um, and a really good thing. And there are other aspects. Um, some of the principles of international environmental law are mentioned in, in the treaty, for example, precautionary approach, ecosystems approach, and so forth. So, you know, there's going to be overlaps, and I don't want to imply that there's an either or situation here, that it's one or the other. Um, and we've got another question from Lucretia, um, who asks us if, if there's any financial mechanism envisaged or proposed by certain countries within the BBNJ. Yeah, um, so of course, this is a common feature of MEAs, but at the moment, we're really struggling with the question of whether or not states will be required or not to provide funding. Um, I think that even if it's a um, voluntary structure, we may very well see a fund established, um, but um, yeah, how it will work is still a long way down the track. Certainly, the developing countries are very keen to see that as part of the treaty. We have another question from Issa who asks, is there a standard criteria for determining national jurisdiction on the high seas? And what measures are in place to prevent powerful nations from breaching such shared territories at the expense of the less powerful? Wow, great. Um, well, of course, um, there is a question, right? If you're talking about areas beyond national jurisdiction, you have to know what are the areas within national jurisdiction. and um, you know, there, there are obviously some grey areas in some places, for example, where you have, um, you have contested areas um, or areas that a coastal state claims that other states reject as being inconsistent with UNCLOS. Um, another wrinkle, of course, is that the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles lies underneath the uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. So the continental shelf is below the high seas. So um, we really have to rely on the, uh, in the provisions in the uh, Law of the Sea Convention to resolve some of those issues, which, you know, will potentially go on um, in, in, in some way. In terms of power in, in large states, um, I, I often think about that in terms of dispute settlement and, and what are the provisions to encourage non you know, to deter non-compliance and, and to deal with violations. There currently is a dispute settlement pro, pro, uh, provision in the draft convention. It's very, uh, it's relatively brief. It simply mirrors a little bit of the UN Fish Stocks Agreement and applies the, uh, the UNCLOS dispute settlement procedures. 
Um, but um, there's only really been about an hour's worth of discussion of that at COP3, um, and it certainly is very underdeveloped. The, um, the, the Secretariat for the Negotiations are actually in a few days running a, an online seminar about dispute settlement, and it's something I've written about. Um, but um, there's, there are issues there. So obviously, um, some are advocating for it, the right to have an advisory opinion. Um, some are... Um, uh, quite happy just to apply UNCLOS mutatis mutandis, which is problematic because if you've got UNCLOS sitting alongside other agreements, um, then you potentially run into jurisdictional challenges. Um, and then, of course, we've got a couple of states, and I'm, I, you know, I'm, I mean, China has been um, quite averse to putting compulsory dispute settlement procedures in place in this treaty. And I think they've been arguing for consent as being an important part of any dispute settlement processes. So whether or not we're going to see, you know, much uh, in the way of dispute settlement, I don't know. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's watch the space, I think. Now we have another question from Soso Loso. How will the treaty affect countries away from the sea? For example, landlocked countries. Um, well, of course, landlocked countries have the same freedoms of the seas as every other country. Um, and UNCLOS put in place some safeguards for, for those countries. In terms of um, what its impact is, well, um, to the extent that you have vessels operating on the high seas, then this new treaty will apply to you. I, I must say that there hasn't been a I haven't noticed a large amount of participation from landlocked countries in the negotiations. Um, I suspect that many of them feel it's a little bit too far from their core interests. Um, and if, but of course, um, if we do apply the common heritage of mankind to marine genetic resources, then that would apply to landlocked states as well. So the, there are different ways that it, it, it will apply. And in fact, landlocked states are no different in some ways than other coastal states because this is an area well beyond national jurisdiction, um, which all countries can participate in. So I think it's worth paying attention um, if you're from a landlocked country uh, as well. Excellent, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so we've got another question from Gibrilla, who asks, currently Africa in collaboration with the UNEP is developing an African Ocean Governance Strategy which addresses, among other things, areas beyond national jurisdiction. What is the relationship between this effort and the global effort in harnessing resources beyond national jurisdiction? Great question. Um, so I'm not familiar with the, the development of that, um, that framework, but um, this treaty isn't supposed to take away from regions the power to, to manage and regulate their own areas. So. The area that I'm familiar with is the Pacific, and the Pacific has a number of strong institutions um, that that look at the ocean and regulate the ocean, both fishing and other activities. And the idea is that where um, regions, you know, are, are doing a good job at, at at managing things, then you know, there's no need for the BBNJ Treaty to jump in over top. And of course, some countries are worried that that might happen. Um, so, you know, in, in many ways, it's not a bad idea to, to be looking at these things and trying to work out what your priorities are for the areas that you consider adjacent or, or close to you. Um, and, and I think that, you know, and if, for regions that have that good development of good practices and, and policies, then that puts that, those countries in a much stronger stage when they engage in the COP later down the track, because that's going to be um, a really helpful sort of agreed position. So I think the negotiators will be very aware of the overlap between BB and J and, and this, but I think it's a, it's a good initiative. Excellent, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for participating. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to answer all of your questions. There were lots and lots there. Um, but mostly, most of all, I wanna thank Joanna for such a thought provoking seminar and for sharing her time and insights with us. Um, so all of you in the audience though, um, please register for the next seminar, which will be on the 2nd of November. Um, and it's titled The Prospects of International Wildlife Law and will be presented by Ari Traubost. So please check back for that one.
And thanks again for joining us and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Take care and good night. Thank you.